Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. You know what today is? It's our 200 uh, episode. I can't even say that right. 200 episode. Epitha. It's our 200th it's episode. episode. Yes. Fat tongue. Sorry. We made it. We made we it. We did. 200. 200. Now 200 we do regular episode. Regular episode. We do have a lot more. I think we're close to 270, but those are due to our Nightmare Before Christmas episodes. So there's 60 of those. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. Something yeah. like that. Yep. It's very exciting. It is so exciting. So uh, here you have a good one for us today. I do. I've got a very interesting case and it's a case dealing with something we've never spoke about before. Oh. So before oh. we get in, I want to say the content warning for those that are sensitive to things dealing with infertility and child loss or miscarriages. This might not be for you. Not that we deal a lot with it, but no. No. All right. You ready? All right. Yep. I'm ready. Just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, where Cam and I live, uh, lies a town called Collinsville, Illinois. Oh, that's super very close. close. Mm-hmm. 20 minutes, maybe. Now, nothing much happens in Collinsville. I mean, there is the annual science fiction and fantasy convention. There's the Italian festival, and there's a few conventions, like uh, more conventions, I should say, like there's a gym and bead show for crafters. There used to be scrapbook conventions, you know, that kind of hobbyist type conventions. Mm-hmm. I think there's also the like the world's largest ketchup bottle. I think that's, that's what I was going. Though. Yes, it is. Oh. I was going to say that. Besides being known, they're billed as the horseradish festival, where you can taste horseradish ice cream if that's your thing. Their major claim to fame in Collinsville is the world's largest ketchup bottle, which stands at 170 feet. And it's actually a water tower that was built in 1949 to supply water to the Brooks Ketchup Factory. Mm, I love there ketchup. you go. I'd marry it if I could. <laughs> and there's also the Cahokia Mounds, which is an ancient Indian burial mound and the largest pre-Columbian settlement north of Mexico. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a historical landmark. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what UNESCO is, it's the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So it's the real deal, people. It really is. It's really interesting to go there. Have you ever been? There's that much over there. No, I have not. It's Mm -mm. the the mounds are really interesting. It's a fun day trip to go. Spend a lot of time there. Now, it was in this town of Collinsville that the Merrifields raised their blended family of 13 children. In August of 1999, the Merrifields were looking forward to adding two new grandchildren to their ever-growing family. Their daughter, 18-year-old Josie, was due any day with their second child. And their daughter, Sandra May, who was four years older than Josie, was due just a short while later with a baby she had long been trying for. The Merrifield's family was large, consisting of nine girls and four boys, with plenty of little ones running around to keep things interesting. But before August was over, tragedy would strike the family. Now, the patriarch, Joe Merrifield, ruled his house with an iron fist, and people who knew him described him as having many secrets. And Uh some of the documentaries strongly suggest that life in the Merrifield house was one full of abuse. Oh. But that's what they say. They haven't found anything to actually support that. One of the elder girls in the family, Sandra May, or Sandy as she was called, spent much of her youth helping her younger siblings. She would read to them, play with them, help them with their homework, and still managed to do other household chores. Sandy stepped up into the mother role since Joe and her stepmother, Eileen, were always gone. Sandy was considered reserved and responsible, and her nurturing personality made her the perfect candidate for a career in nursing. 
Sandy had recently begun going to school to become a nursing assistant and had landed a job at the Bohannon Care Center in Lebanon, Illinois. She and her boyfriend, Everett Jackson, had moved into a trailer in O'Fallon, just a few miles up the highway from Collinsville. By all accounts, Sandy was very proud of the things that she had accomplished, and she was very happy with the direction her life was going. And there was just one thing that she could think of to make her life complete, and that was to start a family of her own. She wanted a baby of her own. She'd been taking care of younger family members for years, and the prospects of raising her own children didn't scare her in the least, and she was just, she knew she was ready for the challenge. Unfortunately, Sandy was having difficulty with fertility. She had conceived a few times, but unfortunately, those ended in miscarriages. And then when she was trying to get pregnant, she was having problems conceiving. And for Sandy, someone who wanted a family more than anything, this was understandably heartbreaking. It is. I remember Mm, trying to get pregnant with uh, my first, and it was devastating when it didn't happen. Mm. Born in 1981, her younger sister, Josie, seemed to be the polar opposite of Sandy. She was vivacious, she was outgoing and funny, and she loved to sing, even though some people claim she couldn't even carry a tune at all. That's no shame in that game. Nope. Sing it loud and proud, baby. Her favorite movie was Stand By Me, and she loved to paint her nails red. A family friend is quoted in the Belleville News Democrat saying, quote, she was funny, always kept us laughing. There was never a dull moment with her, and she always had something to say. So when Josie was 16 years old and announced to the family that she was pregnant, to say that Sandy was taken aback by the news would be putting it lightly. In fact, she was devastated. She very much looked at the whole situation as unfair. Sandy's point of view was that she was the one with the job, the steady boyfriend, and the responsible life, and she was the one who should be having the baby not her irresponsible sister, who was still in high school and didn't even know the baby's father. Oh. All the attention that Josie was receiving over being pregnant was like twisting a knife in Sandy's heart. However, Sandy seemed to make peace with it and welcomed her little nephew into the world in 1997, but her jealousy never went away entirely. She felt that only a baby of her own would squelch that gnawing feeling of envy and inadequacy. The following year, Josie got a job at a local Taco Bell where she met fellow employee Chester Marshall. The two began flirting, and Josie spent too much time trying to get Chester's attention that she ended up getting fired from her job. She was young. Josie wasn't upset about losing her job. She had caught Chester's attention, and the two began dating. And dare I say that they fell in love. People noticed that Josie began spending a lot of time at Sandy's house when she wasn't at school or working at McDonald's. Sandy claimed that Josie flirted with her boyfriend Everett, and whether or not Josie was serious about the flirtation, or if it was just her personality, it didn't really seem to matter to Sandy. Also, Sandy just might have been seeing something that wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. That happens quite Mm -hmm. often. Because from what it sounds to me is Josie, that was just her personality. Very outgoing, very Mm -hmm. who she is. Either way, a seed of doubt was planted and Sandy became even more jealous and began to worry that if she didn't give Everett a child, he would leave her. A few months later, Sandy found out that her sister Josie was pregnant again. Only this time, she said she knew who the father was and it was her boyfriend Chester Marshall. Sandy and Everett suggested that maybe Josie give the baby to them. Since Jesse was still in high school and wasn't prepared to take care of a new baby and a two-year-old, Jesse seemed to give this suggestion a lot of consideration. But Chester, he was very excited about having a baby. He convinced Josie to keep it. This decision really upset Sandy, and tensions between the two grew. Then, a miracle seemed to happen. Sandy announced that she, too, had finally become pregnant, and the two sisters were both due in late summer. So they yeah. had all the time. They bonded again. It was joyful. They were good bonding over the pregnancy. Now, rumors started floating amongst the family and around the Uh-oh. town of Collinsville that the father of Josie's baby wasn't really mm-hmm. Chester's and that it was actually Everett's. Oh. Sandy's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Now, Sandy did her best to ignore the rumors, but uh, it was kind of hard and she kind of couldn't do it. I mean... When I kind of have that little inkling of jealousy and then somebody puts a voice in my brain, you know, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I can understand where she came from there. 
Although not always outwardly apparent, the anger and jealousy that Sandy felt towards Josie became more unmanageable as time passed. I'm sure she stewed on that. Oh, yeah. Then on Thursday, August 11th, Josie went to Anderson Hospital in Maryville and gave birth to her second son. She was released the next day on August 12th. And she came home, and she had only been home for about a half an hour when Sandy showed up at Josie's house. And she suggested that they all go for a ride. So the two sisters packed up the two-year-old and the brand new baby into the car and headed out for a drive. Later that evening, Everett returned to the trailer that he shared with Sandy and got the shock of his life. Upon entering the home, he noticed that Josie's two-year-old son was there, and he also saw that Sandy was holding an infant. And when he asked about the baby, Sandy said that it was their baby. He's like, what do you mean this is our baby? He asked her. And Sandy responded that she had gone to the doctor's office earlier that day and she had some abdominal pain and just had the baby in the doctor's office. And the doctor just let her go home that same day. Mm -hmm. Right then and there. Everett, who wondered why Josie's two-year-old was in their house, couldn't quite wrap his head around what Sandy was telling him. And then he asked where Josie was, and, and Sandy told him that she had gone to see Chester. So that's when panic kind of set in for Everett, because he realized they didn't have any formula, they didn't have any baby supplies, nothing, you know? Mm-mm. It was mm-hmm. just kind of flustered. So he hurried out and went to the store to buy things for the baby and kind of put any uncomfortable feelings that he had aside, because he had to do for the baby. Mm-hmm. But before he even went to the store, he takes Josie's oldest child to the Merrifield home. And when he gets there, all the sisters, remember there was nine of them, all the sisters asked where Josie is. And Everett tells her that's exactly what Sandy told him, that Josie went to see Chester. So in the meantime, Chester had gone to the Merrifield's house to see Josie and, the new, and his newborn son, right? Mm-hmm. And when he got there, they told him that Josie and the baby weren't there. And in fact, they thought that Josie was with him. And Chester assured the Merrifields that she hadn't that he hadn't seen Josie all day at all. And then the news got to Everett that Chester was looking for Josie, and that's when his heart sank. And Mm. he wasn't sure what was happening, but he knew that it wasn't right. It wasn't sitting well with him. Mm -mm. Also, on the way back from the store, Everett ran into Joe and Eileen, the father and stepmother of Mm -hmm. the girls, and they had been out looking for Josie. And (laughs) they tell Everett that, they were just at Sandy's house, he, him, his and Sandy's house, and they were knocking on the door. But even though they could hear her inside, she never answered the door. Mm-hmm. And then they were shocked to hear Everett tell them that Sandy had had her baby, too. Wow. Nobody knew that Sandy had a baby. No. They knew Josie did, but they didn't know Sandy did. When he returned home to Sandy, he noticed the baby's car seat, and it looked eerily similar to the one Josie had for her baby. He questioned Sandy about where Josie was again, and the pit started to grow in the middle of his stomach with each passing minute, and it got bigger. And especially when Sandy tell him that they couldn't tell people about their newborn baby. Why? And that's when Sandy coldly informed him, quote, Josie's not coming back. Oh. He then loaded Sandy and the babies into the car and took her straight to the police department. Once at the police department, Sandy confessed to the authorities that she didn't know if her sister was alive or dead. Yeah, she did. And questioned further, she told police that while driving, she and Josie got into an argument over the baby's father. Who was it, Josie? Who was the baby's father? And that seed of doubt that was planted all those months ago had apparently eaten at her until she couldn't take it anymore. Mm. And Sandy pulled the car over and the two sisters got out and they continued the argument. Sandy told the police that that's when she blacked out. And when she came to, she was holding a bloody rock in her hand and her sister was lying in a ravine. Sandra agreed to take the police to the ravine and that's where she had last left her sister just hours before. And guided by Sandy, the police found Josie Lynn Merrifield lying face down in a creek, her hospital ID bracelet still on. The 18-year-old new mother was dead. Later, the autopsy report would say that Josie had suffered blunt force trauma by several blows to the head, powerful enough to render her unconscious. But she had died from drowning. 
Josie had been alive when she fell face first into a creek, but she couldn't save herself from the creek water since she was unconscious. And I believe they said or that I I read that the water was only like six inches deep. I mean, it wasn't very deep at all. Now, the police took the baby back to the Anderson Hospital and a labor and delivery nurse recognized him immediately as being one of the ones she had taken care of the day before. The hospital compared the footprints of the baby to the ones on the Josie's baby's birth certificate, and they said it was a match. And the baby was Josie's, not Sandy's. This is when police is kind of, police are kind of noticing that Sandy didn't really appear as though she had given birth earlier in that day. And if she had given birth, where was her baby? Was she even pregnant? While questioning her again, Sandy said that the whole argument with her sister had caused her to go into labor in oh. the woods. Mm-hmm. And that's when she gave birth to a stillborn boy. And then she panicked and she threw the stillborn infant into Horseshoe Lake and took the baby, took Josie's baby in his place. Now, Horseshoe Lake is the second largest natural lake in Illinois, by the way. Lake Michigan is the first. So it's a huge lake. <laughs> it is. Huge. And divers from the Bubble Master Underwater Rescue Team were in Horseshoe Lake by Friday morning. And at the same time, police were questioning Sandy again when she finally admitted that she'd never been pregnant at all. She had fabricated the entire thing. She confirmed once again that the baby in their position was Josie's newborn son, leading police to believe that this whole ordeal was much more sinister than they initially thought. Sandy was charged with first-degree murder. The police were convinced that this had been premeditated because, well, Sandy knew she wasn't pregnant, right? And when she first lied about being pregnant, she had to know that she would eventually have to find a way out of the lie. Killing her sister and sealing the baby was her end game. they believed. And the authority believed that Sandy had made up her mind right at the beginning of this whole charade to find a way to steal her sister's baby and to claim it as her own. Because remember, she was supposed to get the baby at first, right? Or she was thinking she was going to get the baby. Yeah, but still doesn't make it yours, though. It's not. No. It's not at all. However, a clinical psychologist by the name of Dr. Diane Sanford was consulted for the defense to determine if Sandy suffered from mental illness. Dr. Sanford concluded that Sandy had postpartum psychosis, presumably from when Sandy had had a miscarriage, and that she also suffered from dissociative states from being abused as a child. The doctor felt strongly that Sandy was not entirely responsible for her sister's death, and that it had not been premeditated. Postpartum psychosis is something that happens to some women when their hormones become grossly imbalanced after birth. It's not usually something that occurs from a miscarriage. Depression is, understandably, you know, a common occurrence after a miscarriage, but symptoms caused by a chemical imbalance are not usually severe enough to reach the level of killing or kidnapping in situations concerning miscarriage kind of feel that's weird, too, but I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. Sandy Merrifield was given a plea deal and pled guilty to second-degree murder. She would go on to serve just seven years of an 18-year sentence. Both of Josie's son were taken from the Merrifields by the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. The older had been living with the Merrifields with Josie, and State Attorney William R. Hines filed to have the children removed from the Merrifields, stating, quote, The circumstances of this, the oldest child's home environment, may endanger his health, person, or welfare. Some reports indicate that the Merrifields try to get custody of the baby. Just some reports, though. The DCFS had 60 days from the time of the murder to investigate the environment, which was the Merrifield's home, where Josie's two boys would be raised. Eventually, both boys were adopted outside the family, so one can only conclude that the DCFS did not find the environment satisfactory. DNA tests would later reveal that the infant's father was indeed Chester Marshall's, not Everett's, as Sandy had feared. 
the father of Josie's older son has never been publicly revealed. Need to know that anyway. Now, a few years ago, the infant, now grown, gave an inter- interview with KMOV, which is a news station here in St. Louis. And in that interview, he said that he was robbed of a loving family and a home. Because he was taken from his family, he says he ended up having problematic childhood. He said, quote, I was definitely abused verbally, physically, and emotionally. I could have had a good life in childhood, but someone snatched me from it. Chester Marshall claims in the documentary Twisted Sister, which is a Khloe Kardashian thing, by the way, TV series. It, it is? Uh-huh. That, I think it's Chloe. It's one of the Kardashians. Chester said that he tried to get custody of his son, but this son, Jay, we'll call him, said that it wasn't true. That's not true. And that his biological father just didn't want him. Chester claims that he did try to get the son, but the boy said, yeah, that's a lie. Two, three sides of every story, right? Correct. So I'm not commenting on either one. While the Merrifield case is not technically a cesarean kidnapping or fetal abduction, meaning a crime of child abduction by kidnapping of an at-term pregnant woman and extraction of her fetus through a crude cesarean section, thank you Wikipedia for that definition, This one, the baby was already born at the time of the abduction and his mother's murder. This entire ordeal is almost beat for beat. It's the same description of those types of crimes. So while it's not technically a fetal abduction, it still kind of is. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. Barely 20, the baby was barely 24 hours old. And I think that plan was there even before she had that baby. Exactly. Cesarean kidnappings are very rare, like extremely rare. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but it is. Between 2003 and 2015, there were only 14 cases in all of the United States. And the most well-known one that we know Mm -hmm. is probably, who do you think? The one here in Missouri. Yep. The 2004 murder of Bobby Joe Stennett in Skidmore, Missouri. Lisa Montgomery, a woman with brain damage from fetal alcohol syndrome and suffering from several mental disorders from a lifetime of abuse, strangled a young woman, cut the baby from the womb, and fled the scene. Miraculously, the baby survived. And Lisa Montgomery was executed by lethal injection for her crime on January 13th, 2021. Now, some experts believe that this type of crime occurs when a woman desires a child so badly she's prepared to attack and kill a mother-to-be by cutting the baby from her womb to then try to pass it off as her own. And these types of crimes, the perpetrators are almost, they almost always fake their own pregnancies, and they either pick a victim and then announce their own pregnancy, or they simply announce the pregnancy, and then the closer they get to their due date, they desperately start looking for a victim. In the case of Bobby Joe Stennett, the perpetrator, Lisa Montgomery, knew her victim peripherally. They both attended the dog shows, basically. The women who commit these crimes have usually lost a baby of their own at some point and may be unable to have another. Sometimes, but not always, they desperately want to produce a baby in order to keep a boyfriend or husband in the relationship, which is so sad. I think they just get so caught up in it, maybe. And it's the fantasy. They want to live out the fantasy in their head of having a child or maybe they feel it'll make their life complete. I don't know. I I, I have this devil on my shoulder, angel on my shoulder thing where I feel really sorry for them. I feel compassion and empathy. But then it's like you Plus, you, you how, kill how somebody. You, you, but how do you ever think that reasons. that's going to not be revealed? You know what I mean? I know. There's, especially like pregnant young moms. Everybody is waiting for the birth of the baby. So exactly. it's not like, you know. Exactly. It doesn't just I, I go just, away. I know. It's... Teresa Porter, a Connecticut state forensic psychologist specializing in female violence, debunked the notion that the prime motive is an obsessive desire for motherhood. Quote, it's not the maternal urge run amok, Porter says. The perpetrators are driven more by narcissism and grandiose delusions than an obsession to nurture. She goes on to say in a Guardian interview, quote, there's no evidence that these women bond with these babies they snatch. These women are often extreme con artists. They are psychologically impaired, but the majority are not psychotic. Porter added that the abductions were driven primarily by maternal obsession. Then infertility would prompt thousands of perpetrators, which doesn't happen. Some experts believe that women who commit these crimes 
tend to be compulsive and manipulative, and they are mainly seeking power, control, and attention. They crave the cherished status of pregnancy or new motherhood. Pregnancy is a powerful tool in a woman's arsenal for achieving and maintaining the upper hand in a relationship and for gaining attention and respect from their surrounding social groups. Unfortunately, what lay in the heart of Sandy Merrifield at the time she murdered her sister and stole her baby will never truly be known. All we have to go on is her word. Was she a woman desperate for motherhood or was she a woman terrified of losing Everett that she hatched this devious murderous plan to keep him? And to say that she's of sound mind seems to be a stretch as well. I mean, after all, somebody of sound mind would have realized that people were going to notice that her sister was murdered and the baby went missing. And mm-hmm. at the same time, Sandy just happened to turn up with a baby. Mm. Mm, now, yeah. now today, Josie's baby is 23 years old. She's five years older than his mother was when she was murdered. Mm. And he's very active on social media. He's a musician and an artist oh. living in Illinois. Oh. And he keeps the memory of his mother, Josie, alive through many of his social media posts about her. Oh, good for you, buddy. I felt That's weird nice. kind of giving out his name because he deserves privacy. And I know he talks about her and I know mm-hmm. he's done interviews, but I feel I, weird I get you. If giving he his hears name this out. or somebody else hears it, they could tell him. They and can then tell him. reach out to us and we'll do a Gladly little. interview him. Right. But mm-hmm. as for now, he's he's a young man of 23 years old and he's very handsome. I went on his Aww. pay. He's a very handsome kid. Young but man, I should say. He's seems not a to kid. be doing okay. Mm-hmm. That's good. Now, Sandra Merrifield is now a free woman, and uh, her whereabouts are unknown. I don't even know. She might have changed her name. Probably. But she's free in either way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think going through and just looking about all this information, it reminded me of uh, uh, one that was so bad. <laughs> in, um, and it also happened in Mil- Illinois. It was about a couple years after. It was in 2006. And it happened in Belleville, Illinois. Do you remember that mm. one? No. Uh, I like was. how you said this. This doesn't happen that often. But it, it does. It, but I know. Like but it does. I think it. I know because it's the Lisa Monk, the Bobby Joe Senate case. This one, the one that you mentioned, that was kind of by our hometown mm-hmm. that we knew. And I think it's it's just sticks out in our mind, maybe because it's so gruesome mm, and it's so mm-hmm. horrible and incomprehensible that it makes it stick out more. Maybe. But, yeah. But it really doesn't happen. It's rare. It really is rare. But this one, and I wrote little bits and pieces down of it just to get the right information. But mm-hmm. Tiffany Hall, 26-year-old woman mm-hmm. from... They this lived was in, what year? This, 2006? 2006. So this was like seven years after. Okay. From what we're talking about. Tiffany Hall beat her best friend, Jamela Tunsall, who was 23. She beat her with the leg of a table. And Jamela was eight months pregnant at the time. Then Hall put Jamela's body, she was unconscious, in a bathtub. I think she was eight months pregnant. Um, anyway, this. That's but awful. she took scissors <gasps> and cut the fetus out of the womb. Scissors? Scissors. And then after Jamela bled out in the bathtub, Tiffany took Jamela's body and dumped it in a vacant lot in East St. Louis, which if anybody is familiar with the East St. Louis app, dead bodies in vacant lots are very, seem to be very common. And then hours later, Tiffany called the police saying that she would gave birth to a stillborn. But it was really weird because when the doctor said, hey, we're going to take you to the hospital and get you examined, she like refused to be examined. Then days later, Tiffany picked up Jamela's three other children from their father's house. And it's Demund, who is seven, Ivan, two, and Janella, who's one. And then she took them back to where they, she had killed her, their mother. And then told the babies, hey, we're going to take a bath. And then drowned them each in the bathtub. No. But, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever heard You don't heard remember this? this? No. no. And then, then she took those babies' bodies and hit them in the washer and dryer. Oh, God. No. I, I didn't. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. And then um, about a week later, she was arrested after she admitted to her boyfriend that she had killed Jamela just to steal the baby, the unborn baby. And the boyfriend did the right thing and contracted the police. Like she had bought so stuff. She, did, oh, oh, she had bought oh, things to, oh, hold to help up. the baby. Mm-hmm. So she, uh, wait, a week? Like she lived with this for a week and never uh-huh. gave her... They even planned the the still her stillborn baby, which was actually the baby she stole. They even like had a 
funeral arrangements for it and everything. Uh, hmm. She took the plea deal. She took a plea deal and pled guilty to four counts of murder and one count of intentional homicide in the death of a fetus. And she's serving a life sentence without parole. Like her lawyer said she had the IQ of 70s in the 70s. Mm. He thought at one point that the death penalty was going to be taken off the table and it wasn't, I believe. Mm. And that's why she took a plea deal. You don't remember that? Mm-mm. I believe do me, I would have too. What, Oof. And what stuck out to me was putting those babies in the washer and dryer. Like police were in the home and walked right past it. I mean, yeah. I don't even know what to say. Horrible. No, I don't remember this. Mm-hmm. 2006? 2006 in Belleville. Were you here? Were you still no. in L.A.? No, I was still in L.A. That's why I don't remember. Yeah. That's because I was like, 2006? No, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> now, see, that's interesting that she No, you had to be back here because my oldest was born in 2006 and you were back here. Wait a minute. Hayden's born in 2003. Tess is 2004. I think we bought the house September 2006. So just right around the same time. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, they're all horrible, but that's the one that stands out. They were best friends. And, you know, the other ones, they, one I remember, there's another one where the lady actually escaped and the person who was going to take her baby was actually the one that ended up being killed because they had a fight and the pregnant woman stabbed the oh. would-be murderer and killed her. And wow. she went to the guys where, hey, I've got baby clothes for you. Do you want? And she's like, yeah, yeah. it was a town that, yeah. Man. But, yeah, it's scary stuff. That is not like a crime of passion or something that just happens. Right? Like you have to think about that, especially, mm-hmm. you know, you hear those women fake a pregnancy because they have this all planned. So, I mean, there's months that goes into this, too. You know right. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Especially if you fake your own pregnancy. Just horrible. And I lied. It's homicide is the leading cause of death in pregnant women in the United States. Oh, God. So it doesn't That's have terrible. to be just by your partner, I guess. Mm hmm. <sighs> Huh. So well, interesting, Jen. Uh, yes. We have any promos for the people? We no? do not. But I would like to give out a shout out to all of our listeners. We've got some great emails and texts and DMs and everything from listeners who've just found us and they're binging our content mm-hmm. and they love us and we thank them so much. I love you and I thank you. And I'm also it's, sorry at the same time. <laughs> it's amazing. You have to when we say that you make our day, you really do make our day. I don't know if, um, if the good people out there realize that you and I literally will throughout the day, if like a review or something, we'll send it. And uh, my go to is, ah, and I yours know. is like, isn't that neat? Isn't it that is so cool? cool? It makes me so proud. And it really does make my day. It gives us, I mean, we have really pep low in your self-esteem. Step. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like We're some days self-esteem. when you're tired and you're thinking, you know, you're you know, writing it, one of these scripts or you're researching something and you're just, yeah, it makes it worth it. So it does. We so, thank for all the good, positive reviews that people leave on Apple or anywhere, really. Um, we and see the them mostly if they're ones on too, Apple. as long as you give us constructive criticism so That's we true. can fix it. But That's there's true. certain things about us that we can't fix. No. And if you want to know what those are, take a, go down that <laughs> rabbit us. hole up. Right on the rabbit hole of reading our reviews and you'll be like, they have three hosts or, (laughs) you know, that we're both vocal fry. But if you want to know what's wrong with us, just uh, write us and we'll send you our thesis. (laughs) Yeah, we we got it on. There's a lot. There's a lot. But um, anyway, we thank you for all the kind words. And um, it really does make our day. And also, didn't we get a little goodie bag from somebody? We did, from our friend Andy Hamlet. He sent us a bunch of stickers and pins and magnets from his store, um, stabbyhamlet.com. It is his store. They basically feature a bunch of underground indie artists. It's very um, cute. Dealing with like death metal records. And he's got, I think his uh, main character is Stabby and they're stick figures with knives and they're, it's fun to go on the website, stabby.com. You can order t-shirts, there's comic books, there's music, CDs, there's everything. Just awesome. Go check them out. I think you'll think it's kind of fun, just like we thought it was fun. So yeah, I loved put it. one and magnet on my desk at work oh, did and you? one on my fridge at home. Yeah. Oh, I so mine cute. got pillaged by... Uh, 
my Children? daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Took it and she I, I stuck some on. I haven't seen her in weeks. I oh. couldn't tell you. So, yeah. <laughs> Mine loved it. She's got all of her folders, stickers on her folders. She's got one of the magnets on her car. Yeah, it's fun. She Super loves it. Super cute. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Stabby you, Hamlet. Andy. Yeah. So, stabbyhamlet.com. S-T-A-B-B-Y-H-A-M-L-E-T. So, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's all we covered. That was our 200th episode, if you can believe it. Nico, cue the magic music right now. <laughs> Kidding, and there isn't any. Just thanks, everybody, for listening and letting us go to 200 some odd know, episodes. Right? Yeah. Oof. It's, Who would have we're found? honored. We are honored. We may be lazy, Jen, but the <laughs> one thing that you can say about us, stubborn, because neither one of us will give this up because no. it, would, it would let the other one down. And, nope. you know, survivor, outlast, outwit, outplay. Exactly. Exactly. Have you been watching anything on TV lately? Have I been watching I ask anything? as I smile and laugh. Because I well, know you have. As you know, I had the COVID last week. So mm -hmm. when I say I stayed home from work for three days, by the time Thursday came around and I was ready to go back to work, I literally was TV'd out. I don't think that's wow. ever happened in my life. I know. I know. I know. There is one thing that I watched and I need to, I want to discuss it with you off air because it would be something that I think maybe we might want to look into for okay. doing something on Patreon because it's truly unbelievable like there's no words i don't even know okay. what to say but we'll get okay. to that what have i watched i've watched so many movies i can't even tell you let me take a little look see here real quick well Can i, I just finished the first season of truth be told with octavia spencer as i don't the get lead. that channel oh yeah well you can you have an apple phone that's how I we know. got it they gave you a uh like a year subscription for free because you bought an apple phone that's how we got it Oh, um, the one I just bought? But anyway, Octavia Spencer put is a podcaster, or a journalist that turned podcaster, because of course she is, and she put away a man in prison. Like, her writing led to his being oh, incarcerated. Uh -huh. And it's your one of your boyfriends, by the way. <gasps> it's Aaron Paul. Oh, Jesse Pinkman. Jesse Pinkman, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And then she goes and she starts feeling that maybe she put the wrong man away. So she goes back to try to right her wrong and mm. it's really good i had a little shock at the a little twist oh. a little shock oh. um lizzie kaplan is also in it she plays identical twins so she plays two parts mm. but i really enjoyed it They're very good i can't wait to watch the other two seasons next season has kate hudson in it i believe oh, oh. so i was shocked by the star power that's in here well you good know writing gets that you mm -hmm. know it's a very good story. I liked that a lot. Aww. I'm trying to think. I'm still big into Poker Face. Still loving it. Yep. Yep. Natasha Leone I like a lot. I'm trying to think uh, what else. I know. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to look it up here real quick. Just like, started Bad Sisters on Apple because I got it for free. I'm going to watch it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's Irish. It's very, it's a black comedy thriller. It's very good. I'm only like one and a half episodes in. And then, of course, The Last of Us. Damn it. That's a good show. Have not watched it. Uh, I don't know if I will. Makes me cry. It scares oh. the hell out of me. There's yeah, one that. point that I thought I was going to crawl out of my skin. I was nope. scared or it creeped mm -mm. me out so bad. I shouldn't actually say scared. I should say it creeped me out. Yeah. Well, the, hmm. care, the, the creatures are mm -hmm. nightmare fodder. They really, really are. Yeah. Like, they're creepy. Hmm. I'm still going down my uh, Academy Award nominee, so I watched Tar. Oh, yeah. And I Tar. watched Tar. What was the other one I watched? Oh, uh, Triangle of Sadness. Did we talk about that yeah, yet? Yeah, you talked about that last did, episode, okay. I believe. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's see what else did I watch. Did you watch the Col Colin Farrell one? I started that. Yes, yeah. It's it's really good. It's different. But yeah, yeah. I did. I liked it a lot. I can't um, even pronounce what it is. Uh, well, it's a made-up island, if that makes you feel better, because then... <laughs> The fact that you can't say it is okay, then. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just watched He's so like handsome, a, too. I, I think he's a nice person. Oh, I've I'm seen sure a lot. he is. So, yeah. Well, he's recovering now. Yeah. He, yeah. So, mm -hmm. that's... Well, which is good, because mm -hmm. I don't know if, uh, sure. you know... It extends his lifespan now. Yeah, exactly. Gosh, there's just so much. I don't know. I'm telling you. It's the Banshees. His movie is the... I had to look it up. The Banshees of Inisherin. Yeah. I don't know how to say it, either. Inisherin? It's good. It's different. I liked it. So I still need to watch The Fablemans, Women Talking, 
and the one that I'm waiting for to go cheaper, the <laughs> everything, anything, everywhere, that one. Oh, yeah. Which I think looks really good. You should but, come watch it on one of our stations because I think it's free on one of did our- you get, Did you already watch it? No, not yet. It looks like I something to, I think your husband would like. Oh, I know. We just have to sit down together Tinder, and yeah. watch it. We've been really busy. To uh, Last this weekend is the first weekend of my oldest daughter's indoor marching. So he and her spent all day yesterday in Lee's Summit, Missouri hmm. for that competition where they got first place. First my place. daughter had a co-solo, which was oh. kind of fun. And... uh the second song they do and the one she's got a solo for is Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones. So that oh, not only was it on the Wednesday, the Wednesday Adam show, where it was constant. I'm constantly humming it. Now when mm-hmm. she practices, that's all I hum. Dun, 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 <laughs> Oh, kids, I tell you. Yeah. It's a good song. Good. So It is. Can't go wrong with that. Yeah. But other than that, that's all I've got. Uh, I got nothing else either. Like I said, I'm trying to build my little studio next door and uh yeah just uh yeah it's yeah <laughs> that's all i got yeah i got other stuff but you know oh. all right a I little guess, shout uh, out to get everybody um known we will be in austin texas in august for the true crime <laughs> podcast festival that's when it's going to be right in august you said, you said it with a question mark i yes, know it's in i august. think it is in august yeah so it is in august, uh, yes. you can make plans to come see us there there's a whole bunch of great podcasts that are going to be there there's Besides a lot us. more this year i think than right than last past, year maybe right yeah, yeah. it's a good so time that's exciting. Have fun. come yes uh come, and come see, see us. us and uh come have a drink with us at the hotel bar that's what we'll be when we're not behind our table so just yeah, people watching, people watching, getting to know I mean, other podcasters. T- networking is networking. what it's really called. But well, never, not really it's listeners too. For me, yeah, yeah. All right, Jen. So until anyway. next week, remember lock your doors and keep passing those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.